All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, this is the, uh, uh, the Road to Mobility as a Service, uh, Mass Part 2, uh, focused on payment uh, systems. Uh, my name is Derek Fredheim. I'm going to serve as moderator for this session. Um, and before I introduce our panelists and, and myself, just want to talk a little bit about um, the direction of what we're planning to, to discuss during this session. Obviously, one of the most uh, promising uh, paths to increase shared mobility and a way to, to lower emissions um, is developing mobility as a service, uh, solutions and platforms. Um, and that requires uh, close coordination across sectors and collaboration between service providers. Um, you know, com complete journey planning and having the ability to complete a single transaction to access a variety of services mm -hmm is really the, the desired customer experience. Items such as account ownership, ease of consumer payment, back and uh, reconciliation, data rights and sharing, Title VI and equity are known challenges uh, that um, our panel will address. And now with COVID-19 um, and the impact that the uh, stay at home orders has had on transit ridership, micro mobility, ride hailing and other shared services, the discussion circling mobility as a service really becomes more interesting as transit agencies, transportation, service providers, cities and regions prepare for this post pandemic environment. For those of you who participated in yesterday's mass part one session, which really focused on open APIs um, and journey planning, there was a good discussion about interoperability, data sharing, and providing a seamless user experience. In addition, we heard uh, one common theme uh, from the panelists, and that was really the need to create standards and that integrated payments were a key to building mass platforms. So to, just, uh, to discuss the integrated payments piece, uh, in today's session, we have assembled representatives from the payments industry, a system integrator, a third party journey planning and public sector, uh, to address what it takes to support integrated payments within a mass ecosystem. So a little bit bef uh, before we start, I want to kind of introduce my background. I've been in the transportation space since 1990, uh, getting my start with the Orange County uh, Transit District, which is now OCTA, um, working on their commute services branch. We were focused on really helping to try or trying to change commuter behavior reducing single occupant vehicle usage and um, placing people in traditional carpools, van pools, bi biking, walking, that sort of thing. From there, I went to a, um, a nonprofit transportation management association focused on infrastructure and trip planning or trip reduction. Um, and then we had this new thing that came out called the internet. Um, I looked at that as a, in, from an industry perspective, how can we kind of inform individuals of better ways to move around their communities um, and started focusing more on like self-service solutions. So started getting involved with uh, building out architecture kind of solutions for real-time ride matching, van pool, um, uh, traffic delivery services, those types of things. So I've been able to kind of focus on not just trying to shape commuter behavior um, and trip planning, but also leveraging technology um, in a customer facing way. And so I wanted to introduce our panelists uh, uh, and I'm gonna go alphabetically. Uh, Carlos Cruz Casas is a professional engineer and serves as the assistant director over strategic, uh, strategic planning for Miami-Dade County's transportation, uh, Department of Transportation and Public Works. His primary work is to introduce mobility innovation challenge the current procedures for transportation planning and develop a fully integrated transportation system. Uh, Carlos also serves uh, as a board member for the Open Mobility Foundation and a TRB's Mobility Management com uh, Committee. So welcome, Carlos. Frank Kopas is uh, Vice President of Worldwide Sales for uh, Move It. He brings 25 years of sales management experience overseeing the global sales organization and Move It suite of mobility as a service solutions. Move It, uh, for those that don't know, is a leading mobility as a service uh, solutions company and provider of the world's most popular urban mobility app, 
hundreds of cities, transit agencies, and companies use Move It to address their mobility challenges and increase their level of service to residents and visitors. Renee Autumn Ray uh, leads innovation and strategy for Conduit Transportation. Conduit is a technology company which includes payment processing, enforcement, data analysts, uh, analytics for transit, curbside management, road user charging, and public safety. Uh, Renee focuses on reducing barriers to access, uh, uh, to assess for uh, vulnerable populations, including people who have low income or, or disabilities or underbank or lack smartphones. Renee is also very active in the bike share world and sits on a number of TRB committees as well. And last but not least is Van, uh, Randy Vanderhoof. Uh, he's the executive director for uh, the Secure Technology Alliance. The Secure Technology Alliance is a not-for-profit uh, non, uh, not multi-industry association working to stimulate the understanding, adoption, and widespread application of secure technology solutions. Randy serves as the director of US Payments Forum. Uh, this forum is a separate affiliated organization focused on supporting the implementation of e EMV, mobile payments, online commerce, security solutions, and other new emerging technologies. So welcome to our uh, panelists and welcome to our session. So today what we're gonna focus on is we're gonna have some questions uh, connected to um, those challenges, opportunities, and barriers that are connected to integrated payments. Um, and we really wanna look at um, how to best implement those solutions. So we'll take it from a various uh, outlook. So again, I mentioned that mo mobility as a service from a user experience is to really provide a, a look, book, and pay for a complete journey using a variety of transportation services, anything from public transit to micromobility to, sh to a shared ride. So while this sounds fairly easy, we've come to learn that it's fairly complicated, specifically when you look at the requirements for integrated payments. So let's talk about payments and those elements that are required to be in place for an integrated payment experience. We hear much about open payments and standards. Um, so I'm going to toss out this first question to Randy um, as a uh, as a secure technology alignments and payments forum are knee deep in creating, developing and advocating for these payment standards. So Randy, can you explain a little bit more about what are open payments? Um, why are they important for integrated payments? And can you address um, maybe the differences between like what they've called an open loop payment system, uh, you've been, uh, using those open standards and a closed loop uh, uh, system. Can you give us that high level approach for that? Sure, Derek, and, and thank you also to the audience for joining us today for this discussion and my fellow panelists. So um, I think riders participating in a MAS architecture will expect not only a seamless integrated journey for that travel experience, but we'll also have an equal expectation for a seamless integrated payment process as well. And But payments are often seen as a friction point for mobility services, especially for riders who opt for pay as you go versus a subscription payment. Um, open payments mean something slightly different when referring to public transportation ridership versus an integrated mobility as a service platform. In the context of the modernization of public transit fare payments acceptance in large cities like Chicago and New York and London, open payments refers to consumers having the ability to use open loop methods to access public transportation, like a contactless enabled credit card or a mobile wallet such as Apple Pay or Google Pay or Samsung Pay. And these integrations involve riders bringing their financial institutions payments instruments, like that contactless enabled payment card or mobile phone or watch, and presenting them at a fixed reader at a gate or on a bus or at a self-service kiosk. And open loop cards are accepted outside of the transit application, as well as um, that fares can be deducted from the customer account or added to the cardholder's credit balance associated with that 
financial card product. These open payments technologies are complementary to a transit agency issued fare card or payment ticket, which is commonly called a closed loop or a proprietary fare system. Now, closed loop systems involve riders holding or purchasing a transit operator's fare payments instrument, not a financial institution's product, typically. And closed loop payments can be quite flexible in their ability to operate as a cash value stored on the card that decrements for each fixed cost or distance-based fares or even time-based ridership such as daily, weekly, monthly, or even special ridership passes for groups such as seniors or handicapped riders. And they can be account-based and link the the cardholder to a back office stored value system that can hold transit funds in an account and track usage over time or up to a limited dollar value before the account needs to be replenished. Open and closed loop are described differently when we think of multimodal payments integrated into a mobility as a service system that is inclusive of both public and private mobility services. And there are many available mobility as a service payment options, but not all of them can be interchangeably used and used with the same efficiency. And so there needs to be consideration to serving the population of MOS users that have special needs or those that lack access to all payments options or even access to smartphones or data connectivity. So some of these payment products that are available include uh, credit cards and debit card payments. And many transportation agencies and mobility providers accept debit and credit cards to pay for fares and to add money to an account. Some accept contactless payments at fare collection points as well. Additional features might be available for this payment method when using account-based systems, such as fare capping or single card charges by day instead of by individual use or ride. Another payment option is mobile payments. And mobile ticketing and payments are available at an ever-growing number of transportation agencies and are mostly implemented using a variety of forms such as near-field communications technology like Google Pay, Samsung Pay, or Apple Pay, or even scannable barcodes for mobile ticketing providers. These can include both open loop and closed loop payments and other mobility services accept mobile payments exclusively. A MOS system develops and, and journeys are available across multiple modes and it's expected that mobile payment will continue to expand as one of those payment options. Mobile in-app payments is another variation on mobile payments where the payment method is built into the mobile app based on the consumer being able to add a funding account like a bank account or bank card within the mobile app or enabling that mobile app to embed a third party service like PayPal or Venmo inside the mobile app as another payment option. Another payment option is cash payment, but not your typical payment of using currency or coins that you might feed into a parking meter. But other cash payment options are available use it for multimodal travelers with the evolution of electronic cash payment providers, such as companies like Pay Near Me or PayPal and the use of a transit fare card. So for example, LA Metro uh, TAP users um, can log into any private or public computer, select the products that they would like to purchase for that transit app or usage and print out a barcode associated with that product in their account. That barcode then can be taken to a participating merchant and be scanned and cash payment can be transferred to the merchant and the fare balance can be added to their TAP account at a variety of different merchant locations. That TAP card payment method um, can then be extended to other modes of transport like bike shares. Also, cryptocurrency, while it's not currently accepted, is being evaluated and at least internationally could be a future payment option for transportation. 
But since mass services integration assumes that there will be some form of shared application to access multimodal providers and manage payments, a key MAS system component will be accounts and transit wallets with the ability to manage the money or fare products deposited by these various payment types. And so in my final point on mass payments uh, is that mobility inter integration uh, creates value by offering multiple services and modes, allowing riders to plan, book, and pay for a trip from point A to point B, but one that may require multiple trip links. Evaluating which types of payment to accept, however, is only one step towards that payments unification. Strategies are needed to determine pricing, communicate pricing to the customers, and evaluate the interconnected pricing options. And riders need to secure and uh, needs a secure and transparent and seamless management payments experience. And providers of transportation understandably need assurance that each leg receives adequate compensation. It's also essential that in a detailed behind the scenes coordination exists among mobility providers to agree on who will receive how much of each of the fares and when those funds will be received. And to support mobility payments integration, a role of an integrated payments manager is needed within the payments ecosystem. The emerging role of payment manager would occupy space between the customers and the different operators and create the business rules and data management flows across the mobility ecosystem. This role could serve as the primary customer facing entity and unify the process for multiple transactions that flow across the value chain. The payment manager would manage both open and closed loop payment devices and cost allocations for operators on the provider side must be able to seamlessly feed into the payment managers platform while the customers would be able to access perhaps a web based portal to manage their daily and weekly activity on the system. A number of different organizations may fill this role as payments manager, including the transit agencies, mobility service providers, and banking and payments providers. I really think that defining this payments manager role in the MOS ecosystem is going to be one of the biggest challenges that we have to solve so far. I'll turn it back to you, Derek. Great. Thank you, um, uh, Randy, for that detailed explanation. Um, I think those that are uh, maybe unfamiliar with the payments world realize that you've just outlined why things are complicated um, with respect to how, you know, integrated payments work. I like the idea of this integrated payment manager as well. So let's really look at this from the application platform perspective. Frank, move it is one of the if not the, the largest uh, trip planning and mobility as a service application providers in the world. Um, how does MoveIt go about integrating payments within its uh, mass ecosystem? Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about what are the critical business rules that need to be in place? Um, you know, fare policies, those types of things, connected journeys, reserving scooters or a bike, you know, those types of things. Um, can you can you give us an outline of how you folks work uh, to support that open payment um, integrated uh, payment manager um, place? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, thank you, Derek. And a lot of Randy's comments really resonated with me. So um, just reiterating, welcome everybody. Um, thanks for taking the time today. So there are three important components when we talk about integrating payments within the MAS ecosystem. The first is, is data about the ecosystem. So by that, I mean information about public transit, micro transit, car share, et cetera. Uh, what I mean by that is availability, schedule, route, GTFS related information, real time information about where the vehicle is located currently. So that's number one. Secondly is algorithms, the advanced multimodal trip planning capability to integrate in real time and present all the various options as a set of consolidated trip plans while allowing rider choice and flexibility based on their preferences. And third is integrating payments. So having a seamless payment experience. 
And then basically you're, you're looking at all that, all those complex parameters, how long is the trip, how long is the wait time, how many connections, comparing pricing. So, you know, quite complex. And so what we've done at MoveIt is we've uh, invested in developing a, a payment integration layer and we partner with fair payment companies and mobility providers to deliver a complete experience to the rider, either in a uh, either in the MoveIt app or white label versions of MoveIt or or our partners. So this is where we're working with companies such as Cubic, Masabi, um, Token Transit, Uber, Lyft, and other um, mobility providers that need to be part of that complete one-stop payment-enabled experience. Um, you know, a good example of this is our recent announcement with Cubic, uh, where we're integrating multimodal journey planning with their payment engine and, and their back end in several of the largest cities throughout the world. So with regards to your second question around business rules, what critical business rules need to be in place to support open payments? To give you a little quick background. So what we've done is developed a rules engine that enables us to consolidate all these fare mechanisms so we can accurately reflect payment for the trip. So this enables us to aggregate and accommodate various pricing methodologies, including several that Randy mentioned, like time-based pricing, distance-based, zone-based for multiple transit types. And then what we do is we aggregate this from a single agency to either a city or a metro level, where there can be multiple agencies op operating within, you know, within our larger cities and urban areas. So just a few examples to kind of close out and respond to your question to make it a little bit more meaningful. Uh, as you know, rider trips can be very complex, including multiple transfers, and the rules can vary regionally and, and so forth. So in New York City, for example, if you're on a trip that has multiple legs, if I go from the subway to the bus to the train, the third leg has a free transfer because of the first leg. So you need to be able to accommodate that rule. Another example is where the fare price varies based on the time of day, uh, peak versus off-peak, weekday versus weekend, very common in Washington, D.C., greater area. In fact, pr probably pretty much, you know, all agencies throughout the U.S. Another rule that you, you need to understand and accommodate are distance-based fares. So it might be that the calculation is based on the total distance of the trip or a zone, so multiple zones. So if you're within one zone, it's a particular price, but when a rider passes through to another zone, there's a price change. And, and the final comment, and Randy kind of alluded to this as well, is you need to understand all this in the context of the rider profile, because you need to be able to track their travel and their payment history at the account level, and then uh, you know, be able to accommodate that for, for things such as fare capping. Great, thank you, Frank. Yep. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, one of the things that Randy had brought up, and Frank, you mentioned this as well, um, you know, one of the common challenges here in North America in implementing a mobility as a service is that a number of our public agencies have partnered with system integrators who provide fair collection products and services. Uh, many of those fair collection systems are proprietary to the system integrator. Renee Conduit is definitely engaged in this discussion about how can open loop payments work or coexist within a proprietary closed loop system. So what are the near term challenges uh, for integration providers? Uh, do current banking regulations hinder integrated payments? Uh, can you address maybe some of those fair policies and transfer rules that Frank had mentioned? And, and how do you go about getting those managed uh, to provide that, that seamless experience? Sure, absolutely. I'm excited to be here this afternoon and talk through a few of those questions. Um, I think at a high level, what we are seeing from uh, the, the clients that we serve is that they are interested in augmenting their existing closed loop services with open loop, but they see a lot of benefits to maintaining uh, the sort of controlled environment they have with their existing closed loop system. Um, so for instance, when we think about, um, I think particularly in the US, we have uh, most agencies tend to have a very complex um, system of fair policy rules. So, you know, Frank and Randy have mentioned time of day, zone based, 
Um, I would say certainly in the U.S. because of the regulatory requirements we have from ADA and Title VI, we have a number of really innovative uh, incentive-based or income-based um, fair programs that different populations may be eligible for. Those are easier to manage within a closed loop environment. Um, and so what we're seeing is uh, that there is an interest in adding the open loop, certainly from a, a user experience of um, a more casual user, there are a lot of benefits to that. And what we're seeing is that um, places like Paris and Mexico City and some of our other larger systems, particularly where you do have a lot of tourists, are interested in just layering the open on top of the closed loop and being able to capture the benefits of both. Um, one of the things that I think is really important about the way that the people that you've asked to have this conversation and the way we've set up this panel, as we're thinking about an integrated multimodal payment system, we have a pretty transit heavy bunch on the call. And I think what's really valuable, particularly as we're working with people from uh, bike share or from, you know, ride sharing and ride hailing, is that the transit industry has decades of institutional knowledge in figuring out the most challenging use cases for who can access our system, um, both physically and financially. And so we have a lot of value to bring to the conversation in terms of the most difficult use cases, making transit accessible to those folks means that we have the ability to layer on uh, potential other services like bike share and ride hailing and scooter share in a way that's going to be accessible for the broadest swath of the population. Um, so I, wanna, I wanted to lay that out, certainly. And I would say, you know, we are a vendor. So our role as a system integrator is to execute on the policy vision of the transit agencies. So a lot of the challenges of going from closed to open loop are just logistical and implementation challenges that, you know, as an integrator, we, we have to figure out and we have to handle and deliver for the client. Um, in terms of the, you know, some of the challenges would be things like, uh, you know, the cert certifications that you need to accept your credit card on a system, uh, the sort of fees that might be passed through and, and how the agency wants to manage those. So these are all overcomable challenges. Um, it's just a matter of what do the transit agencies want to do and how can we play a role in helping to execute on their policy vision. Great, thank you. All right, Carlos, I know you've been patient in listening to the fellow panelists. You know, public agencies are really in the mass epicenter, right? Um, you're really kind of deciding whether you're going to be a broker or a manager or both um, in your community. Um, in many cases, we've seen agencies look to build uh, mobility as a service solutions to support first mile, last mile connections, um, provide greater opportunities to leverage mobility service providers, and as a cost effective way to manage mobility within your, uh, your service area. Many agencies offer public su subsidies to a variety of rider types, students, elderly, economically mm -hmm. disadvantaged, et cetera. And we know public <clears throat> entities want to safeguard equity and inclusivity for individuals who may not have specific means, such as a bank account, smartphone. They may have a physical disability. Um, so what are the absolute requirements that you feel public agencies need to support MAPS? Can you address those as well as like account management? Who really owns the customer um, in your world? Um, what are the personal... Uh, identifiable information, PII requirements that you need to also safeguard. And then um, along those lines, you know, what are you needing with respect to data? Uh, because it's one thing to have the solution. It's also from a city planning perspective, it's important for you to know how people are utilizing the services so that you can plan your system better. So can you talk on those fronts? Definitely, uh, Derek, thank you. Thank you very much. And I'm, let me tell you, there was a long list of questions and I was patiently here waiting uh, from the beginning, even when Randy mentioned all these cities with open payment. I'm like, Randy here, we have open payment in Miami. You didn't mention that either, but I'm excited to be here today. Uh, so let's start with uh, 
with what you mentioned, it's definitely that public transportation agencies are at the epicenter of mobility as a service or so this mobility ecosystem and the mobility marketplace. Uh, I could even mention that perhaps without transit, uh, there will be no mobility as a service, right? There is a share mobility, but bus is the ultimate share mobility. It's a key component for cities to, to thrive. Uh, however, I think it's critical that we start redefining what that means, public transport. Public transport in the past could have been just bus and rail. Uh, but I argue that today should be bus and rail plus everything else that connect people to opportunity. And I think that's critical for us to start thinking about that because it opens a conversation and start leveling the fact that we're not, it's not only us and them, public and private, it's about moving people more efficiently. And I'll touch on that in a little bit. Um, but if you break it down to the most basic role, if you will, of the public transportation agencies is, is managing the demand in the public right away. And there's, there's a key components for integration that we want to talk about. Here's, there's all the technical aspects that uh, Randy, Frank, and Renee have covered very well. Um, but there's all the things that we need to start getting into. So I think for this to work, we need to make sure that we are all uh, aligned in our goals and objective and what we want to get out of it. Uh, we need to think about how we maximize the resources in the public right away, how we right size the vehicle, and in particularly how we talked about the cost per ride. Because I see many great applications out there. Um, they're, they're linking together mobility options. And, but if you link mobility options together and each one of those legs have full price, we're basically not helping anyone, right? We need to figure out a way for us to do integration of payment, but integration of fare structure and how we'll be able to complete that trip. Uh, what's the components that are needed there? Um, so, so talking about that, I think is, is critical that there is an exchange of, of understanding of what that mobility option is doing for our community and how we want to price that or how we want as public agencies redirect subsidies uh, that, that we have. Our role, and we do it very evident when we provide public transportation, is to subsidize a portion of that cost uh, for, for the user. But we do the same thing for, for cars on the street, for cars parking on the street and many other options. So now it, it, I think it's an opportunity for us to step back and see how, what's the best use of our resources in order to put it into play. Um, and it might be that a shared mobility option is the best mobility for that need at the moment. Um, and then we talked about data and it's, it's, it's critical for us to understand um, we talked about the, the user profile, uh, the cost per trip, uh, and the, the basically how this is kind of linked together, um, because that's going to allow us to be able to make better decisions in terms of where we direct the subsidy, where we direct those those funds, and what type of trips we wanna we wanna cover. You see great partnerships throughout the nation for uh, for TNCs, for transportation network companies, or even partnerships with bike share companies and, and scooters. Uh, but it's not for every trip. There's particular trips that are covered, and I think it's critical for us to understand that the, in this mobility ecosystem, there is a there is a place and and time for every mobility use. Uh, and and although uh, some people say sometimes transit is not for everyone, I can argue is is for everyone, but not for every trip. And the same thing for the other mode of transportation. So all that is critical for us to understand. Uh, you talked a little bit about the the customer ownership, right? this mobility marketplace, this ecosystem that is being put together. Uh, I think that is a, a healthy business case for mobility providers, uh, augmented mobility providers, or even mobility aggregators. Uh, it, regardless, regardless of public or private, it doesn't matter, as long as we are all going after the same community values and goals. I think that's critical that we understand what are we trying to get out of uh, the mobility system. Uh, and every community is different. And I think that's the key. That's where we enclose the equity. Equity is not the same across the entire uh, nation, entire cities that we have or across the world. We need to start looking at how each community is different and how we want to address uh, the equity. It's not only about the color of our skins or the accent in our uh, voices, but it's, it's a lot more uh, beyond those things in equity than we need to take uh, action. Uh, like Renee mentioned, you know, public transit agencies have been doing um, the equity aspect um, and uh, for years, for many decades in trying to integrate uh, mobility, that the outcome of the mobility is that people can get where they need to go uh, with the lesser impact 
uh, to to their to to their different groups. Um, and in this, I will argue too that even in the personal identity file information that you mentioned for a little bit, um, we've been doing that for many years, protecting data from the fair collection systems uh, in a way that we know more about transit transit users than we know about scooters, TNCs, and other mobility options. So there's this uh, misconception sometimes about the, the fact that transit agencies or public agencies cannot protect data, I think is the opposite. It's more about how we classify that data, how we make sure that it's coming in as a, something that is secure and protective for us to do, because we have done that for many, many years. And, and I will remiss if I don't mention that, if we don't get this information, you talked about uh, transit planning information, corridor planning information, origin destination and so on. But ultimately, if we don't get access to, to real data information about how people move around, um, we're gonna fail in doing our job as custodians on the public, public right away. If we just let things to happen without understanding what's going on on the street and how we can direct uh, monies or subsidies, incentives uh, and fees in order to, to drive the uh, behavior, we're gonna be failing on that. And, and it's important to know that We've been doing mobility management, uh, management of the demand on the street for years. You know, it's simple, basic management of public right away is uh, traffic signals, green light, red light. And we don't think about that. Agencies have the authority and the power to make sure that we move people more efficiently using those tools. And the same thing we do for street signs and other components. So why not on mobility option? Why not on using payment integration uh, and incentives to make sure that we start managing that demand in time, space, and mode. I think that is critical for us to do. It's not going to be easy. Uh, I'll say there's going to be a lot of help and needed from the public agencies. There are agencies of all sizes. There are small cities and there are big cities. There are major metropolitan areas. I think there's an opportunity for different aspects of, of uh, collaboration between public and private. And ultimately, it's a game that all of us can be, can be uh, playing. And, and I will urge everyone to kind of figure out a way to work together uh, to make the most out of this. Yeah, I, you know, you, Carlos, you really accentuated that piece. I mean, it really does take um, collect close collaboration with your partners. Um, and and that, that stems from also trust, right? Um, and you also mentioned one thing that uh, Jay Kim, who's a, a assistant general manager for LADOT is mentioned in the past and you kind of touch on that and that's what he calls infrastructure as a service right so cities really are managing that ecosystem but I do want to get back to that, that collaboration and the trust factor um, and that really boils down to some of the things that we were talking about is um, this connected journey and you know pain with um, uh, you know once for multiple services, which means that you, uh, as Randy mentioned, I think he said he called it an integrated payment manager. So how do we build this solution and really direct rec reconciliation and payment settlements that everybody trusts one another that they're going to get the dollar or whatever it's owed to them for that complete journey. So I'm going to open that up to, for everyone to kind of raise a hand and, and, and see where you feel this is, um, you know, where this needs to go. Go ahead, Renee. Yeah, um, so I'll start by saying that um, I think one of the challenges to the way that we have seen uh, MOS pilots happen in, um, you know, Helsinki or parts of the UK or Europe is, um, you know, the built environment is so different, and I think there's a lot of feeling that they're, they're, um, the role of government is so different there that what happens there won't work here. Um, and so I would actually look to the U.S. example, which is um, uh, tolling agencies across regions and even state lines have had intergovernmental agreements for 15 or 20 years. So we have a U.S.-based model of um, multiple government agencies with a very strong financial incentive to make sure that their payment reconciliation is accurate, coming together, creating policy documents, and making sure that whatever different vendors are involved um, 
execute on the, the business rules that they establish through these IGAs so that if I'm driving with my Peach Pass from Atlanta, I can go to South Carolina or Florida and feel comfortable that all I have to do is drive because the hardware and the software and the payment systems will be reconciled. So I would, I would look to that, mm -hmm. that mode as a model for us in the U.S. Yeah. So that's just a very interesting model. Um, that, that one is, is more of a pay-as-you-go, and basically you continue to pay the full price, right? So I think the component that we've seen the transit agencies have done for years is more in the regional aspect, right? And when you do not the pay-as-you-go, but when you do the monthly pass or the day pass and you start doing um, – uh, distribution is, is I think there's a trust among different transit agencies about uh, getting their the fair value back in terms of that trip because it was already a model established up front. Um, I think what we need to do moving forward is um, we need to understand that there needs to be another component of injection of, of, of funds, if you will, because uh, again, even if we do this multi link trip and we, we get a bike to a train and a train to a, to a, a minivan to take you, um, we are not going to be able to capture the full price of that trip in order to pay everyone, right? So we need to figure out what's the way for us to kind of distribute. And I think that might be an opportunity that if that is of value to the city and the public agency, then we need to capture that value and figure out a way for us to cover that portion. Otherwise, we're always going to be fighting towards a splitting a very small pie. Right? We're not going to charge someone for a trip integrated uh, for $50 for 20 miles, right? And, and I think that's where we start getting into the aspect, what's the proper value for that trip and how we can distribute that small pie. And I think that's when I think if we redefine public transportation and we start talking about, you know, yeah, maybe that scooter, maybe that bike share is part of the public transport. And maybe we should cover a portion of that trip. And yes, the customer only paid 25 cents for that trip, but the, the company is getting their 75 cents, right? And I'm just putting numbers in here, but it's critical for us to not only do the, the equation of how we distribute the money that we're getting from the fare, but then how we augment that as a match from agency or any other partner, right? I think there's another opportunity for non-traditional transportation partners to say, I want people walking and biking. And that might be that someone isn't providing incentives. I think rewards programs are critical for us to start driving good behavior. And there's other partners in this conversation that can help us match that price. And I think that's going to allow us to get to the trust component because all of a sudden everyone is going to be a little bit more happy because now they're seeing I getting the fair value back to the service that I provided. Yeah. And I really, um, your comment around, you know, incentives and, and subsidizing behavior really resonates. I think that's an area that there's there's a lot of opportunity. We as, I think, companies like MoveIt and other technology providers, it's, you know, our charter to try to, you know, rapidly innovate to support all these moving parts that are going on. In, in the U.S., you know, we definitely have nothing near a pristine environment, right? We, with, with policy, with multiple, you know, public and private companies operating in certain regions. So, you know, we, what we try to, to do and to recommend is to, you know, get, get things started. You, you, you know, you can't solve this problem, you know, in the next year and just go and get something that's perfect. But there is rapid, you know, innovation hap happening out there in the tech community that's supporting, uh, supporting this. And there's still a lot of open questions, though. It was talked about, like, who owns the account and how's that being managed? And, and, uh, and you know, there's policy implications. And, do I, if I take a, a multi-leg trip that has, say, multiple providers, if I add that up today, that's who's going to take that trip, right? We would rather have it looked at to where, you know, I'm, I'm paying something that incensed me to take that multi-leg journey. So it's a complex. I think, I think on the policy front, I want to direct this question as a kind of a follow-up because we really, it sounds like what we all agree to, the practitioners anyways, is that technology is not the barrier, right? We have open sources and what have you. It's really policy. Uh, that serves kind of as a cornerstone or the foundation. So along those lines, uh, Randy, are, are the existing banking regulations in the United States supportive of an integrated payment with a full settlement engine in place? Or does things in that realm need to change in order to get us to where we need to go. Yeah, thanks, Derek. You know, I, I live every day in the open loop, kind of open banking environment. And so I've come to understand, you know, the way it works 
and works pretty efficiently is that there's there's a common set of rules that are established and the participants who want to participate in that system or on that network have to prescribe to a certain set of um, requirements and testing and um, they have you know liabilities if they break the rules or if they they fail to comply with with the regulations and what really troubles me about this in mass environment is you know there is no central kind of clearinghouse or or rule setting body that's going to make the rules for how we're going to manage uh, payments and share payments information on on the platform so um, it's, it's going to be increasingly difficult. You know, I use the, um, um, the model of, of if each, you know, individual city developed its own mass strategy in terms of pulling together um, the transit agency and the five or six or 10 different um, modes of transportation operation in that community and, and, and form the consortium of, of interests and establish some, some rules for how everybody would play, um, you know, they could do that and they could achieve that. Um, but, you know, scalability becomes a challenge because you, don't, you can't just replicate that in the next city or in the next community because there's a different set of players with the different roles in terms of their stake in the in the in the ecosystem and 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 influence on the market, and so um, I'm constantly wondering how we're going to be able to to scale up a mobility as a service beyond just what an individual kind of group of of like-minded participants would want to do, and come up with a a, a statewide or a national or a regional system that would work well, um, unless there's a way to define those roles a little bit more clearly and come up with some regulations about how individuals can apply to be a participant in those roles and what expectations they're willing to meet to do that and how everyone can, can also um, then start to follow those, those prescribed guidelines so that everyone understands what the risks are, understands what the costs are, and um, feels comfortable sharing information because if we can't share that information across these platforms, then you know it's it's going to be really difficult to try to get a consumer to be able to be able to move seamlessly from one service provider to a different service provider and try to uh, realistically rely on on one common payment method across all of those platforms. Yeah, I I could see that. Go ahead, Renee. You had a follow up. Sure. Um, I would I would agree with Randy about the level of complexity and what is possible and what is likely to happen. Um, I would say my concern is the just the nature of how we manage transportation in this country doesn't really lend itself to a, a national model. And um, frankly, I you know I think especially coming out of COVID-19 and um, I think the the power of tech companies is going to be increasing and I would be worried that we end up in a walled garden situation where Uber and Lyft sort of gobble up the market share and um, I have to say I really like the approach that um, Frank's company Move It has where they're sort of vendor agnostic they work with a lot of different companies and um, you know someone like Transit App doing the same thing I think um, feeling that you have a lot of different options and that my move it app might almost be uh, a sort of tra a transportation version of um of a mobile wallet and that you know even if i can't get everything i think what's more likely to happen is something more organic like that that might be um run by or managed by some of these technology startups and i hope that it includes some of the folks that are going to have a more vendor agnostic take um, instead of creating mm -hmm. a walled garden system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can see why Move It has a rules engine, right? Because of the complexity, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and I want to pull this one from uh, from the participants here. Um, are there any U.S. cities or regions that are doing integrated payments um, well? 
uh, with this multimodal mass solution that you guys can point to? <laughs> I, I think there's some cities that are are taking a strong lead and are trying to build that that model out. Um, but they're doing it, you know, based on what their capability exists <laughs> with their resources and their service agreements and um, kind of long term vision. Um, we certainly think that um, that LA uh, Metro has has shown some really thought leadership in this area in terms of what they've done by building um, an API platform above on top of their um, central management uh, system that allows for third parties to be able to plug into that and be able to exchange information through APIs to be able to deliver that service. Um, but again, even a, a, a city as, as big and, and a system as complex as, as, as LA is only gonna be able to move as fast as the partners that are operating in those cities are willing to um, maybe give up some of their autonomy and sign on to being a part of the TAP system or whoever the other agency is that's taking that lead. And there's a certain tension right now in terms of fighting over who owns the customer between the public service providers and the private industry providers who both you service those customers in, independently and someone's going to have to give up some of that control uh, to cede it to the other, and how those relationships get defined, I think, are going to um, are going to be interesting to see. But it's probably going to take some time to figure that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. I, I don't know if anybody's doing it extremely well yet. I think it's just in the U.S. at least. I think we're on the verge of it. There's pilots going on. I mean, from our point of view at, at Move It, we're presenting already multimodal trip plans and more and more of that every day. And in many cities, if the payment uh, transaction's not executed yet, we're starting to present payment information, at least so the user sees or the rider sees, you know, what is that trip going to, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to take uh, from a cost point of view. Um, but I, I do, there are other encouraging signs, I think, where we're starting to see some statewide initiatives that are, um, you know, there's some RFIs and RFPs that are starting to think about how can we kind of standardize and at least have you know, an open interoperable, you know, ecosystem to facilitate what we're all talking about today. And I think part of the reason there's not, you know, good examples to point at yet is the reason we're talking about it is super hard. It's, I mean, the payment, it's, yeah. it's what we're figuring out. So, yeah. So, so yeah, uh, on that point real quick. So we talked about the standardization of payment, right? And how you'd be able to do that. And I, there's, there's new ways to, to get to that point. I think a critical aspect for any city or agency to become successful is what happened behind the scenes, right? So we talked about open loop and closed loop, but there's also card base and account base, right? And I think the only way for us to be able to do this integration behind the scenes of these APIs is for agencies to move, move fully to account base system. And that means that the, that the value of, of the fare, the value of the components of the transit trip resides on an account instead of a, a transit card. And that's the only way that I'm seeing um, ability for third party integrations to be, to be able to validate that trip and making sure that we know that account 00745 from transit is the same person as 4567 from the TNC. I don't need to know the name, I just need to validate that it's the same trip, it's the same person so we can introduce transfer. We did a pilot last year between a TNC in transit using uh, the account system from their side and the open payment on our side to link that trip. I think there's not, I'm not gonna tell you that it's fully successful at the moment, but there's ways for us to get the ball rolling, but until everything becomes account-based, it's very difficult. Yeah, so along those lines, I'm gonna address uh, Elliot's question here is, uh, with respect to industry standards uh, and interoperability uh, for these platforms, you know, what is a role? Who, who, who is the, the best person to help set those standards? Is it state DOTs or FTA? Is it industry groups? Like who, who is responsible for, mm -hmm. for creating that standard? Who wants to take well, that? <laughs> well, 
I, 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 this, I'm the least technical person in this, this group right now. I can tell you one thing. I'm a big fan of open payment elements to it. Um, and, and that's not, that doesn't reside in the city or the state. That's basically a, a standard that has been adopted worldwide and people should go that way. But again, this is me without knowing all the details. I'll let it to the expert on that side. Yeah, I think, Renee, you mentioned something about institutional knowledge, and I think that's really important in terms of figuring this all out. And that's why I tend to lean closer to the, the transit agencies and, and their ability to, to manage how they handle their own integrated and regional transit service providers. Um, they seem to be a little bit further along in being able to come up with alignments on scheduling and on, on fares and, and being able to do uh, transfers between um, service providers. And, and so I, I, I think they have, um, they also have, you know, the regulatory um, um, oversight, which is important and have the trust of the rider. So I think they're in a strong position to take this lead. I think where they're hampered is that this is not their priority, right? Their priority is to keep the trains running and keep them safe and trying to build out a whole new ecosystem beyond this means that, you know, individuals like Carlos and others are doing, you know, double the job that they are normally doing uh, to try to build out for the future while they're still trying to manage in a very difficult environment, the present. You know, uh, yeah, I would say to um, FTA led an interesting series of calls I guess maybe in 2018, and they included and just you know people like Mastercard, people like us, um, individual transit agencies around um, you know open payments in general. So it wasn't a standard developing committee, but it frankly was a very helpful uh, capacity building exercise across these different partners. Um, and I think there's, I mean, you know, we're in like a golden age of open source standards. This is like my uh, nerdy hobby on the side, right? But um, I think you can see some interesting models. So for instance, um, you know, the general bike share feed specification just got redone last year. And I think it was a combination of like the North American Bike Share Association, you know, contracting with, um, you know, I think like Populous and Trillium, but you had a situation where you've got um, the, the, people that hang out on GitHub and write the standards as well as like a national organization like Bike Share, you know, and that, but kind of figuring out, okay, we're going to have to pay somebody to help us implement these standards and, and really, you know, take all of the ideas and, and uh, you know, write a standard that works. So I think a model like that could work um, just by the nature of the financial incentives in the payment industry, you're probably going to have a heavier industry presence. Um, but I think there is some, you know, public-private um, level of, uh, you know, working meetings that would actually help you accomplish something like that. And I think the transit agencies would have a strong industry in um, basically um, requiring their vendors to adhere to the standards once they're developed. And I think that would benefit transit users and, you know, all of us, frankly, taxpayers. Um, that's my that's my take. Definitely. I'll add some uh, context to this as well. There's a, a nonprofit out there called Mobility Data that's working on this now, um, predominantly because GTFS F, which is the fare piece or F2, has not been widely utilized um, uh, with uh, many of the, the, the transit agencies. And it really goes to maybe some of our earlier comments. It's about fare, fare policy and uh, transfers and rider types and those things that create challenges um, when you're shifting, uh, especially when you're doing distance-based, uh, you know, fare collections and all that. So there is a group working on this of industry folks. Um, uh, time will tell on that. Um, so we've got uh, about 15 minutes left. I got a couple of questions. Um, I guess the, the one question is when it comes to developing these solutions, is it, um, is it the responsibility of the agency to manage this process like what's happening in Smart Columbus? Um, or is it better to have um, a more collaborative approach where you have all the various providers coming in, you got best of breed you know, technologies and so on and so forth. Because as we know, technology advances, uh, I say this like dog ears, right? For every, year that goes by there's seven years of technology 
uh, happening. So how does a city uh, who wants to develop this ecosystem manage that whole solution um, and continue to pay for that um, with all those advances technology? Who, who is the gatekeeper and what's the, the best role for that? Anybody want to take that on? Carlos, do you think the the agency is is more of the manager, kind of managing the process and overseeing it, um, and bringing in uh, kind of open solicitations and or um, you know we mentioned LA Metro. One of the things that LA Metro has done is have an open solicitation for public-private partnership type of solutions as a way to test these advanced technologies. Um, so there's skin in the game on both sides. Um, I don't know if we can solve this, you know, today, but uh, I'd be interested in learning a little bit more about maybe your viewpoint on this. You're, you're on mute. There you go. How about now? Perfect. So, so yeah, I think, you know, this is, this is a, a, a role for everyone to be playing in, right? Of course, I think there's, it's, it's key that the public agency, and I'm going to say it that way because it can be a city or, or a transit agency, to me is ultimately who is the mobility management agency, who is the custodian of the public right away, to, to, to do two things, right? To, to one, to uh, work with third parties and find a way to integrate them into uh, our system. You know, there's a question here, what we need to do. We need to create an account-based system that will be able to interact behind the scenes so we understand those fair rules and transfer between the third party providers and us, right? That's, that's a key element for us. And that's critical for us to do that solicitation and come in and say, hey, come and play with us, right? Come, this is innovation playground, what we're able to do. The other side is at the same time, we need to open up, right? We need to make our technology available. I think we haven't talked about this, but we need to start seeing uh, open APIs for transit tickets that can be placed everywhere. Right, I think it doesn't matter uh, right now. I would love to have my ticket in, in, in Frank's uh, Move It app and in, in, in Transit app and everywhere, even even a, even a mall. I don't care what applications out there. And until agencies start opening it up and say we'll do open payment, we'll do closed loop, we'll do cash, we'll do also open APIs for ticketing, then you start seeing more people coming in and say let's figure our way. Ultimately. We, are, we have a role to, to fulfill, but doesn't mean that someone else cannot do something similar. To me, it's critical that at least everyone has the same information and it's the same pricing component and the same elements to make sure that we're, have, we're not putting anyone in a disparate impact. Great. Um, so I wanna talk about where we're at in today's environment, right? We're all at a stay at home order. Um, or most of us are anyways. Um, we've seen transit ridership um, erode quickly. Uh, we've also seen, you know, impact to this COVID-19 on the various micro um, service, you know, micro mobility providers, even the TNCs, right, hailing services. You know, Uber and Lyft have, have laid off some folks. Um, and we're seeing that there are some regions like in Kansas City who have opted to eliminate fares altogether and offer free transit services. Um, and we are also seeing, you know, that being considered in other areas. Um, so if you remove transit and the complex fare policy from that, but it's also serving as the backbone of moving the most amount of people within, uh, within a, a city, um, how does it integrate, how does that impact uh, integrated payments and what what would what would uh, a free transit system have within the mass ecosystem? Uh, I'll start and and say that um, even with a free system, there's probably going to be some means by which people identify themselves if they're a resident or an authorized rider just to do tracking of usage and, and, and um, uh, load, you know, load balancing and other things. So uh, this is a, you know, this is going to be a big investment. And therefore, uh, if we're trying to do a big uh, infrastructure shift 
towards um, mobility as a service and doing it without having a way to monetize the investment, I think it's going to slow things down. Um, but um, cities like Carlos that have implemented account-based systems um, and others that are building on an account-based system um, are preparing for the ability to leverage that with a back-end settlement engine that could then be more uh, able or nimble to be able to make those, uh, those connections with the other service providers. And then having a mobile provider um, like a Move It or, or others that can come in and, and layer on the, the, the mobile um, uh, interface and, and, and connectivity, um, I think there's an opportunity to, to see some progress there. My, my hesitation is always that, um, you know, public transit tends to be risk averse and move very slowly, um, whereby um, public industry providers and mobile providers tend to want to move very quickly. And there's that, that tension between um, speed to market and safety and security, and then where's the profit motive for the uh, public industry players or the private industry players really to, uh, to invest if they don't see a good long-term return uh, is going to also be a factor. Great, great, great point. I think, you know, in, in terms of, of the mobility as a service, right? So let's talk about that. And, and I know you mentioned about some cities going full fare free. Um, ultimately, I would love to see, and I think I saw an article about what's the fair recovery ratio for some of these cities are going for free and then what's or not, right? They still, it is, it is a good injection of funds for us to do better uh, transit systems out there. Um, but if you just talk about mobility as a service, you know, we, we, we talked earlier in the conversation about redefining public transport and perhaps uh, re redirecting uh, subsidies towards uh, a, an Uber pool ride or, or a VIA ride or a scooter ride, right? It is different to take a ride from home to a train station than from home to the restaurant that is at the train station. And, and I think it, without the information about that connectivity and without understanding that that person or that device that went into from one place to uh, that, that connectivity to transit and jump into transit, we validate that transaction, that actual behavior, then we lose our opportunity to start uh, incentivizing the appropriate behavior. I think this is something that we need to understand. Like you mentioned, Randy, that transaction can be a zero value, right? It can still be the car, it can be, still be a tap, be zero value. And I wonder what are we trying to do when we start doing these things? Is, is it really an obstacle uh, or, or we need to understand better the, where we need to go in terms of fully integrated mobility system? And, and it, to me, it's critical. I, I just saw, and we are experiencing this in Miami, many other cities now, the amount of funds that we're losing going for free right now during this COVID situation, it is, it is it's astronomical, astronomical, right? And how, how we're going to be able to cover those costs. We're going to continue to subsidize transit, but we're going to get those funds back. And there are a lot of folks in, I mean, transportation funding as a whole is based on, um, you know, some, some are self-help counties, like, you know, we mentioned LA Metro, they've got their, uh, you know, gas tax. I'm sure they're feeling the effect of, of folks not driving. I mean, congestion in that city has gone down just as, as quickly as their, their ridership on their transit lines. And so, um, it's, 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 uh, interesting to see how this is all going to, play itself out. Um, so we've got about five minutes left. Uh, I did want to mention that we did have one other question that I would like to kind of address as well. And that is um, maybe Renee, if this might be directed towards you, if there was a, a, an agency, you know, working in a closed loop solution um, or environment uh, that wanted to uh, work with a mobility, um, a micro mobility, mobility service provider like a scooter company to do an integrated um, uh, payment within a closed loop system, what steps do, does the agency need to take to make that happen? Mm. So my understanding is it's a pretty decent 
uh, chunk of money to move from closed to open loop. And um, the way, my understanding of micro mobility is that the way you access the scooter is with a QR code on a smartphone. So I, you know, if you think about something like um, bike share, there's still some bike share systems where you have like a physical key fob. That could be something where um, the same device that's in your smart card could be something that you use to unlock and pay for the bike share. I could see that working pretty well, um, but my understanding is there aren't any scooters that are unlockable except via smartphone. So um, my guess would be that there's not a lot of incentive for a transit agency to want to become open loop for a micromobility use case. Um, but that's, you know, Carlos, are you, what do you yeah, think? Yeah, so, no, no, and I think, you know, I think it's more of the aspect of do account base, right? You can still do account base with, a, with your closed loop um, and do a, a uh, authentication of an account for transit users and an account for the, 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 the scooter company and, and use the behind the scenes that back office in order to validate and figure out how we're going to be covered mm. that cost. Uh, the, the open loop is another element to introduce uh, other benefits that I think we've seen it uh, as, as is, is more nimble as we have opportunity to have now the Apple Pay, Google Pay and other things coming in. Um, but yeah, I think it's critical for, for to work on your back office and start understanding uh, that you have all the elements to make sure that you can send, you, you can authenticate different accounts per time into the one person doing a transfer and introduce a transfer rule the same way that we do right now for bus to bus, bus to rail, bus to another agency. That All that happens on the, on the behind the scenes as, as an account for transit, just need to do a mobility account and, and authenticate um, uh, scooters and transit accounts. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, there's 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 ways to do that with with technology and and mm -hmm. uh, you know like the work that we're doing to integrate the the agency approved payment provider uh, and then you know bring in other modes. There's roles that technology players providers you know can can also help there to to mask. But that is one of the big challenges is you know the integration to more of a a legacy system um, you know in, in today's day and age. Uh, a, a legacy closed loop system. Yeah. And it sounds like maybe one of the solutions that could be entertained is, is what they're doing in Los Angeles with their tap force API, which basically takes their tap payment instrument um, and creates an open API or an API that allows that to be a payment method within that third party service providers system. So in this case, the scooter company would accept a, a tap solution as a payment instrument on their system. So maybe that's another option. We talked about, you know, having tickets available in these apps, but using your payment rail um, as a payment method could be another solution um, in this environment. So I think we've, uh, we've got, we've come to the, uh, the end of this session. Uh, first, I want to thank each and every one of you um, on the panel for sharing your expertise and, and knowledge and thoughts. Uh, well done. Um, also wanted to thank all those who are um, watching, um, participating. Uh, thank you for coming into our, our session. Um, hand, hands off to everybody. Yeah. Um, appreciate your time and um, look forward to uh, to continuing the conversation. From what I understand, they're going to use Slack um, to continue to ask questions. Feel free to, to leverage that asset. Um, I Great. believe that's the case. Is that not correct, Kevin? Yeah, I will post. I think there was one remaining question about Smart Columbus and something from the comments. So, uh, yeah, feel free to go over to the uh, Slack channel Moss Space and uh, yeah, uh, continue on. And then now we've got these uh, startups, startup spotlight again here, uh, with down to three uh, pitches. And then uh, we will begin with uh, the next round of sessions at 245. Perfect. All right, folks. Thank Excellent. you. So much. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thanks.